Welcome to Lecture 4, Crop Physiology. This is part of the Agronomy 1 ALM 110 subject, which is offered at NMIT as part of the Agricultural Degree. My name is Nikki Cooley. If you require any further information about this subject or our other courses that we offer, please visit our website at nmit.edu.au. When growing crops commercially, it is absolutely essential as an agronomist that you have an understanding of crop physiology. This lecture here hopes to introduce some of the basic con concepts of crop physiology. These include photosynthesis, also called assimilation. We're going to look at different carbon metabolic plant classifications. We're going to look in detail at growth and development and spend some time understanding phenology and the determination of different phenological stages. The principal aim of this subject is for you to understand on how to grow a crop. Plant physiology and the concepts covered here in this lecture 4 will enable us to get some of the background this will lead on to an understanding of how you measure growth and development in the next lecture and in the lecture after this, number six, we will look at use and management. Animals differ from plants and one of the major differences are that plants are able to produce their own energy. This process is termed photosynthesis. It is the power engine of plants it would be very advisable to learn every input of this diagram for this subject. It is so essential to agronomy and the understanding of this process is a significant component of the commercialization of this industry. As you are attempting to optimize the outputs of photosynthesis with minimum inputs, in particular climates and environments. In the second year of your degree, you will learn in more detail plant physiology. In this subject and at this level, year one, we will only learn the overview of photosynthesis. So let us begin. Carbon dioxide is a gas found in the atmosphere. When this couples with water in the plants, which are obtained from the roots, and you have the correct components of light and plant enzymes, you are able to produce a molecule of energy. We commonly know these as sugars and the first stable compound is glucose. Byproducts of this photosynthesis are also that oxygen, a gas, is released to the atmosphere through the roots and six molecules of water remain. You will notice that there is a balance of this equation. There are six molecules of carbon dioxide which are inputted along with 12 molecules of water. This produces one molecule of glucose, releases six molecules of oxygen and six molecules of water. The diagram that you have just viewed is an excellent overview of the inputs and outputs of photosynthesis. But in order to have a thorough understanding, it is good to have a visual perception of photosynthesis and how it works. The following HTTP link on your screen, which is also available in a shortcut in Moodle, is a YouTube video on photosynthesis. Please watch this video several times as it will help conceptually with your understanding. I have selected a few questions for you to answer. Please bring your answers and your notes of this video to the class and we can discuss both your notes and your answers and ensure that your answers are correct. What happens to light in photosynthesis? What is, the, what is a chloroplast? And finally, 
do chloroplasts move? As you will have learned from both the formula and the video, that there are two stages to photosynthesis. There is the light requiring stage, where energy as ATP and NADP are produced. And then there is the non-light requiring stage, or carbon metabolism stage, of the process. In the equation that you saw in the previous slides and the video, you were looking at carbon metabolism in what's called C3 plants. There are other types of categories of carbon metabolism and we are going to discuss these briefly. C4 and CAM are alternative photosynthetic pathways used by plants. So let us have a look at the differences. In C3 plants, carbon dioxide gas from the atmosphere is fixed into a three carbon compound. This is the first stable compound from the Calvin cycle. In C4 plants, atmospheric carbon dioxide is fixed into a four carbon compound. And in CAM plants, they store atmospheric carbon dioxide and produce compounds during the night rather than the day. There are indeed more complexities to CAM plants than just this, but they will be deal dealt with later in your plant physiology subject in your second year. These different types of metabolism, C3, C4 and CAM, have all evolved under different climates and aspects of climates. C3 and CAM plants tend to thrive in environments more challenging, that is if they are typically hotter and drier. These adaptations give us differences to these particular features. In the table on your screen you will see a summary of the differences between C3 and C4 grasses. So the first difference is the initial molecule form during photosynthesis for a C3 plant is, as the name suggests, a three carbon compound, while for a C4 plant it is a four carbon compound. The growth period is different. C3 plants ideally require cool seasons or year-long plants while C4 typically grow through the warm season. C3 plants typically grow in better in temperate or lower temperatures, while C4 plants typically grow more optimally in higher temperatures. They require different amounts of moisture. C3 plants require higher moisture compared to C4. Light requirements are also different, with C3 requiring typically lower light conditions, while C4 thrive in higher light conditions. C3 plants are not as susceptible to frost, while C4 are. C3 production is lower than C4. And the, seed, the feed quality, the last parameter described in this table, is higher in C3 than in C4 plants. So to summarise, there are many advantages and disadvantages of C3 and C4 plants. And whether these attributes are advantages or disadvantages really depends on the environment, the climate and the commodity requirements that you are after. Some examples and illustrations of C3 and C4 plants are provided on the slide. These include saltbush, maize, sorghum, sugarcane, millet, kangaroo grass, buffalo grass and green panic grass. These are all examples of C4, while the C3 family will include wheat, farallus, subclover, lucin, eucalypt, aceus and coxfoot. If you have some time, you might want to try and identify which of the plants listed are illustrated in the figure. 
So let us review what we have learned in this lecture to date. That photosynthesis is a fundamental component of plant development. It has two functions. One is to fix energy and two is to convert that energy into a compound or material that can be transported around the, the plant and used for growth. Plant growth is an increase in dry matter and it is the energy from photosynthesis which enables this process to occur in plants. Constituent growth is a change in cell division, which is an increase in number. Cell enlargement, the cells get larger as they increase in growth. This process requires protein synthesis and is typically irre irreversible. And there is a process of differentiation or cell specialization. For example, a cell can become adapted to a photosynthetic function. There are two forms of cell division, vegetative and reproductive. Mitotis, mitosis is the name for the vegetative cell division, while meiosis is the name for the reproductive cell division. There is a summary diagram on the slide demonstrating these two processes. Typically, for crop growth to occur, vegetative division, mitosis, occurs. The cells divide, and then that is followed by a period of expansion, which is then followed by a period of maturation, or maturity. Cell division is the process by which a plant cell divides into two or more daughter cells. Plants are unusual in that they have the capacity for unlimited gro growth throughout their lifespan. Growth can be divided into three phases. The first, meristematic growth. The second, elongation. And the third is maturation, or maturity of the cell. Meristems are the physical regions of where growth occurs. Meristemic regions are found typically at the end of stems and in root tips. They are the location of cell division. Growth at a cellular level is principally a consequence of increases in the amount of protoplasm. You may find it amazing to know that one single maize root apical meristem can give rise to more than 17,500 new cells per hour, whereas cells in a watermelon may increase in size by up to 350,000 times. In the former, growth is expressed as an increase in cell number. The latter expresses growth as an increase in the size of the cell. While the growth of a pollen tube is measured in terms of its length, an increase in surface area denotes the growth in a dors dorsiventral leaf. There are different types of growth in a plant cell. <coughs> there is either arithmetic or geom geometric. On the figure on the slide, you can see a visual representation of these two types of growth. Let us start with arithmetic cell growth. In the first cell division, you have two cells. This then changes to three cells, and so on. If you go through five cycles of cell division, you end up with a total of six cells. This is showing us that one cell divides during each division. <coughs> when we compare this to geometric, it is quite different, as during geometric, every cell divides into two. Therefore, we start at the beginning with two cells, and during the first cycle, this then results to four, and so on, until you end up with 32 cells over five divisions. Both of these types of cell division can be described mathematically. The formulas are on the screen for both arithmetic and geometric. We will be spending some time collecting data in the field and comparing both arithmetic growth and geometric growth. 
Growth rates can be measured by either weighing the fresh weight of the plant, putting the plant into an oven until constant weight is obtained, and this is called the dry weight, measuring the length or the change in length over time, measuring the area that the plant covers, measuring the volume or change in volume over time, and you can count the cell numbers and measure those changes over time. When we're describing growth in plants, one of the most common growth responses is called the sigmoid growth or sigmoid growth curve. The figure in the left hand side of the slide illustrates the sigmoid growth. There are five phases. The first phase is the lag phase. This is followed by a log phase where growth increases steadily and rapidly in a linear manner. The third phase is a decreasing rate where growth begins to slow down. This then goes into a steady state growth where growth remains equal. And this finishes by senescence, which is the death of the plant or leaf or cell. As we have stated many occasions, there are many external factors that affect the sigmoid growth or relationship of this curve. These include the climate, particularly light temperature and water, the day length and wind, the soil, texture, structure, pH, nutrient availability are also impacted. The biological impact such as weeds, insects, diseases, nematodes and soil microbes can also have an impact on growth. There are internal factors or genetic factors which can also impact on the sigmoid growth curve. These include resistance to stresses, the inherent photosynthetic rate, respiration, and partitioning of assimilates and nitrogen. Partitioning is where a assimilate or carbon or nutrient ends up in the plant. For example, does your glucose sugar end up in the root, the stem, or in the seed you're trying to sell? There are other components to grow, and it is important not to confuse them. As we've stated previously, plant growth is a consequence of cell division, elongation, and differentiation. This generally occurs over a small period in a small location. Specific stages of plant development within the plant's life cycle is referred to as the crop development. There are some questions that we may want to ask ourselves. Is the rate of growth important in crop development? Do growth and development proceed at fixed rates? And are developmental stages modified by environmental factors and cultural practices? as we have learnt that plant growth is. Plant development can be defined as the differentiation of organs which defines the various stages of plant development. We are going to take the case study of crop development of wheat. Therefore, in our case study, plant development is organ differentiation defined by the various stages of wheat development. So let us have a look at the physiological stages of wheat and how they're defined. Firstly, the stages can be distinguished by the process that's occurring in the plant. Germination, emergence, tillering, floral initiation, also called double ridge, terminal spikelet, first node or beginning of stem, boot, spike emergence, and thesis, also known as flowering, and maturity or maturation. These stages may be grouped further. Stage E is the stage from germination to emergence. Growing stage 1 is from emergence to double ring or floral in initiation. Growth stage 2 is from double ridge to anthesis. This is the longest growth stage. 
and this is followed by the final growth stage, growth stage 3. Growth stage 3 includes grain filling period from anthesis to maturation. Physiological maturity is usually defined as the time when the flag leaf and the spikes turn yellow. This was defined by Hoft and Weinch in 1982. The figure on the slide shows a visual representation of wheat development and the various growth stages that we have been talking about in the previous slide. This figure was adapted from the Slafer and Rawson 1994 paper by the FAO on the topic of wheat and growth and physiology. There is a HTTP link on the screen where you can find the original documentation here. I like the visualisation of these developmental stages as it enables you to remember them better. It will be important in this subject that you will, learn to, that you will be able to learn different phenological stages. We will be spending some time out at the Yang Ying farm learning about these stages and how to categorise them scientifically. Continuing with the wheat as a case study for crop development, we can simplify these stages as described previously from emergence, growing stage 1, 2 and 3. A simple but important concept is that genotype, temperature, day length and sowing date can all e impact on the time span of each of these development stages. That is, for example, Growing stage one with ideal temperature, day length and sowing date may be quite short, but in another season where the sowing date was moved, the temperature was less than optimal and the day lengths were longer. This may increase growing stage one. As a grower, it is important that you understand that these stages may change in length due to these environmental and climate inputs. And if they do change in length, then you will have to alter your management timetable accordingly. This really does um, point out how important it is to understand these processes. On the slide you will see a table representing the physi physiology stages of wheat from days of emergence to physiological maturity in a spring and comparing a winter wheat. This data is based on data from the US which was produced by the FAO. Various environmental stresses, particularly heat, but also water and salinity, may shorten the wheat growth phases. This table gives you some kind of idea about the length of each of these stages. So let us review what we have learnt in this lecture. The concepts and underlying principles of photosynthesis growth and development of crop plants. We have learned that inputs such as climate and management can impact on these processes. Understanding the commercial importance of these processes will aid in your farming career. Please remember to complete the questions required for the lecture. And we ended up looking at wheat as a case study for phenological assessment. We will be taking some of these skills into the field in our Yang Ying visit. This brings us to the end of Lecture 4.